So a lot of you know that one of my favorite things to do is to ruin everything with science and cat memes. I love cat memes. There's this one where the woman's like yelling at the cat, ah! the cat's like, what are you talking about? All right. What I want to talk about today, uh, and what I want to ruin today, I suppose, is food with organic chemistry. Because we've been talking a lot about organic chemistry, and we've been kind of keeping it fairly academic, but it also has a huge role to play in our everyday lives, which is something I mentioned more than once, but we haven't really gotten back to. So yeah, there's absolutely some obvious stuff that the things that we eat are generally speaking organic compounds, and that includes the sugars, the proteins, um, the, the fats and the oils that we consume, and uh, vitamins, and, and quite possibly the cheese slices, although not entirely sure. Although most plastics are a organic compounds, so probably. The exceptions of what we eat uh, would be minerals and the water that we consume. And you could argue that they may not be considered nutrients, but they are very important in our diet. But outside of those, I can't think of anything that we eat that would not be considered to be an organic compound. However, we use organic chemistry without knowing it, and we do organic chemistry and organic reactions every time we cook. So we're going to look at a few examples of cooking and, and food processing, I suppose. And we're going to start with an egg. So when you crack an egg into a pan, uh, and I mean, it works true if you're boiling it, but you don't really see the changes so much, it starts out that the egg white is clear. It's see-through. It has no color at all. But as you cook it, what happens is the heat starts to disrupt the protein structure. So the proteins are kind of globular. The attractive forces that hold them in a particular arrangement, the heat disrupts that, and they start to open up and loosen up. And then as they uncurl, they start to make new attractions, which are then kind of hold together. And they interact with that new structure, interacts with the light more in a different way, so your egg starts to turn white. The more of those uh, interactions you form, the more of those new interactions you form, the more cooked, the more rubbery, the more solid the egg becomes, and of course the more, uh, the less see-through it is and the more white it is. Something similar is happening with oatmeal, except not with proteins. Uh, oatmeal has a lot of starches in it, and when you first mix the, the water with the oatmeal, it looks like this, like raw oatmeal, but as you cook it, what happens is the heat disrupts the attractive forces in the starch granules, causes those to open up, but now instead of forming new attractions as much, water is able to get inside of that granule. Uh, so now you have something that's a little bit more spongy, but not only that, because the water is more and more trapped inside this starch granule that is not able to move around as easily, and the water isn't able to flow, the whole mixture thickens, and eventually you get oatmeal that is thick enough to stand on if you've done it right. Popcorn is another thing that has some interesting things, and it's actually, if you pull forward the, the, uh, the oatmeal thing, Popcorn does that as well, except it does it better, let's be honest. Uh, there's water inside the kernel. And what happens is, as that water heats up and turns to steam, both the steam causes a huge amount of pressure to burst the shell of the popcorn kernel, but also, because now that water is heated in steam and is a much, much higher temperature than it would have been otherwise uh, in the oatmeal case, then what happens is the, um, the starch granules really open up and then the water causes them to be very, very spongy. And if you think about, say, something like a, a cheesy puff or something like that, it's actually a fairly similar process that's happening. You need high temperature steam and you need pressure. And then you get that spongy kind of, of thing going on. Rice cakes would be another example of where this happens. When you're roasting a marshmallow, what you're doing is now instead of causing you know, attractive forces to be disrupted and reform, you're actually causing more of a, a chemical change where you're making a polymer. So you're taking these simple sugars, there's lots of those in a marshmallow, you're taking the simple sugars and you're causing them to polymerize. And that would be a condensation polymerization. And if you look carefully while you're roasting a marshmallow, you can see steam coming out of it. Now some of that steam could be moisture in the marshmallow, but really what most of it is, is as the simple sugars are polymerizing and forming more complex sugars, that's a condensation polymerization. You're losing molecules of water. They're coming off as steam.
not only that, but that large network of, of sugar molecules now, or that large po polymer uh, of, of sugar monomers, um, that is now, the way it interacts with the light is brown. It's also gonna be a little bit more sweet. And we call that process of cooking sugar like that and going from simple sugars to a more complicated mixture to a polymer, we call that caramelization. There's lots of examples where that happens. But you get that characteristic of brown, you get a little bit more intense sweetness and you'll notice the bubbling on the marshmallow. Uh, that's where the water that continues, sorry, the water that was escaping after the, the sugars were polymerizing, it got trapped inside the gooey mixture and couldn't get out, but it formed this little bubble. There's another reaction that's a really, really important one called the Maillard reaction. And it is, uh, again, a little bit more complicated. It's a kind of a similar thing to what we just talked about with the sugars, except now instead of just sugars, it's just sugars with proteins. And, or I've got the amino acids and proteins, but basically anything where there's protein and sugar mixed together can undergo this kind of Maillard reaction. And it's common in, in bread crusts, um, brown meats, so if you're frying bacon or barbecue and hamburgers or something like that, and you get that browning effect, uh, it also has a fairly characteristic taste. And I needed to show you that picture to give you examples of that. I shouldn't have done it so close to lunch, uh, for me anyway, because uh, now I'm really hungry and I want to pause here for a while, but that's just going to make it worse. Okay, another one called the shortening effect. And you've probably heard of vegetable shortening, and maybe you grew up listening to a little rhyme about uh, somebody liking shortening bread. I can't remember. Sorry, Mom. But the shortening effect is when you take some kind of fat, um, typical ones would be lard, butter, or vegetable shortening. And if you've ever heard of vegetable shortening, it's called vegetable shortening because of the shortening effect. It does that. What happens is it, you use it with flour and it will coat the flour particles uh, and it's going to prevent them from forming a whole lot of structure. So if, if you think about um, bread that has a lot of structure in it, now bread's really kind of spongy too, so it's not the greatest example. But what you start to do as you're baking bread is you're forming more structure. You're making polymers again. And the more structure you have, the more dense, the more uh, tough it's going to be. So with shortening, what you do is you use butter or some sort of fat to coat the, the, uh, the, the flour particles so that the starches in them cannot uh, expand and form uh, the, the, uh, the larger network. If you compare a shortbread cookie, which is very crumbly and very uh, sort of melt in your mouth, with a chocolate chip cookie, which has a lot more structure, that's an example of what the shortening effect does. Yes, in both cases, you've mixed butter in with the whole mixture, but with a chocolate chip cookie, you don't really work it through all that carefully, whereas with a shortbread, you really spend a lot of time kneading that butter into the flour mixture so that you coat all the flour really, really well. Um, flaky pie crust, same kind of thing. You get a lot of, of uh, spend a lot of time working the butter through the flour. And then the other one is if you have a croissant, which is basically a bread, except it's buttered already, but then they work that butter through the flour mixture before they bake it and they end up with a very flaky uh, kind of bread. You can also do something similar on a slightly lower level with making caramel sauce. Um, basically all you really need to make caramel is sugar and heat and you caramelize it. But by adding different things, and you know, I've seen people, they've added cream, they've added butter, they've added uh, a couple of other d different options. What that does is it interrupts the caramelization process. It interrupts the forming of the polymers. And so what happens is it reduces the amount of structure that can form, so it reduces the solidity. So if you're making a caramel sauce, uh, then you can cook the stuff and boil the stuff even and get that real caramelized flavor and car caramelized color without having the caramelized structure. And it's really, really good. And then you can take the popcorn from before and then the caramel sauce you just made and make caramel popcorn. And that recipe actually uh, I'm going to put in with this video. I'm not going to say you need to make it, but it's an old Oliver family tradition. Actually, it's not that old of a tradition. It's not even uh, a family recipe so much, but whatever. I make it every year. And, uh, and I contemplate chemistry while I'm doing it. It's a true story. Talk to you another time.